This is the January 8, 2023 Sunday edition of Wilderness Wanderings. On this podcast, you will find a reading from 1 Samuel 9, verse 1 to chapter 10, verse 16, and the message from our worship service at Emmanuel. A link to the whole service is on our website, emmanuelministries.ca, or on our YouTube channel, which is at i. CRC Hamilton. May God bless you as you participate. We will pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for this place of worship where we can gather each week for fellowship and worship. Clear our minds, still our hearts, that we can be in your presence now, the Holy Spirit, so we can hear your message loud and clear. Let us take your word into the world in the new week ahead. Please be with your servant, Pastor Mike, Provide him with boldness and truth as he delivers the message, Saul anointed as king. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. We start now. But we're going to do things a little different this morning. To keep it interesting, but also because our passage this morning requires a little bit of introduction. Those of you who worship here regularly will remember that at some point during 2022, Uh, We spent some time in the first part of the book of Samuel, and we have a little bit of time between Advent, between Christmas, New Year's, and when Lent begins in March. And so Pastor Anthony and I decided we'd go back to Samuel, and we're going to take up the story of Saul, the first king of Israel. And before we read the first part of his story, I wanted to sort of set the stage to help you listen well to this story. In chapter 8 of Samuel, there is a large conversation between God and his people Israel. They want a king. And God reminds them that their desire for a king is tantamount to rejecting him as king. And so there's this conflict, this tension between God and his people. And in the end, because Israel persists, God gives in. And he says, fine, I will give you a king. But you can sense the tension in that story. And so the whole story of Saul, as it plays out throughout the next number of chapters in Samuel, is sort of laced with that tension of of Israel wanting a king and, and God giving in, but at the same time recognizing that there's something amiss with this desire and this sense of God having given in. And so when you read the story of Saul, you need to read it with that background. The whole story is sort of permeated with that sense of of tension. The story is rather disjointed. And it has sort of uh, going up in terms of the the, the stories of his ascension where he becomes king. And then as soon as he becomes king, it flips on its head and everything begins to derail. And so we're going to start with that story of King Saul becoming king, of his ascension to kingship. And there's three different parts to that story. And this morning we're only going to look at the first one. And I'm warning you, it's a long story. And so I'm just preparing you that George is going to read for a while. And just be ready for that. And I want you to know that today's story, not a whole lot of people find out that Saul is going to be the first king of Israel. Everything is rather secret. But as you listen to that story, I want you to listen particularly for two things. And one is that it's really a double story. There's two stories. On the one hand, there's a story of Saul looking for some lost donkeys. And then, of course, there's a story of God choosing Saul to be king. And I think those stories are intertwined because they sort of highlight the fact that, that Saul and Israel with him are lost. Not in a in a physical sense but in that spiritual sense that they are doing something 
that God has told them not to do. And so Saul and Israel are looking for a solution. Saul is looking for his lost donkeys, and guess what? He doesn't find them. But God shows up. And as you read the story, you will notice that even though Saul is a main character, he doesn't do anything. He doesn't act. He's looking for these donkeys, but by and large, he just does what his dad sends him to do, and on and on. But it is God. It is God who is acting. As soon as you listen to the story, note the things that God is doing and God is causing to happen. Saul becomes king, not because he acted, not because he wanted to, and not even because Israel thought he was a good king. He becomes king because God wants him to. Now, Israel wants a king like the other nations. And as you read, as you listen and read the story of Saul becoming king, you will notice that the word king is not mentioned. So I've led you totally astray. But we'll, pick, we'll get there eventually. But not yet, George. Just hold on. I'll let you, I'll let you know. So um, the point is, though, that what, Samuel, what Israel is going to get is not a king like the other nations. Israel is going to get a king of God's choosing. And that is part of the tension of Saul's story, especially for those of you who know the story. Saul is God's choosing, and yet, what happens? Saul does not grasp for power. When Samuel comes and says, you are to be leader of Israel, Saul says, who, me? I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, the worst of the tribes, morally, and the least of the tribes. Why would God choose me? And at the end of the story, he comes home, and his uncle says, what happened? And Saul says to him, well, I went to see the seer. I went to see Samuel. And his uncle says, well, what happened? What do you say? Nothing. Sounds like a schoolboy coming home from school. Now, I think that Saul is being contrasted with Joseph, who gloated about his dreams. Because the second thing that I want you to pay attention to between, besides these two stories is the memories of Egypt. There's something interesting here. It says in the text, I have heard the cry of my people. Exactly what God first said to Moses when he called Moses to lead Israel. And God has chosen someone to save his people. And so finally this, the story is not about the kingship. It is not about the monarchy. It is not about establishing some kind of dynasty in Israel. The story is about God's people suffering, and God has heard them, and God is sending a Savior. So with all of that, George, would you come and read for us 1 Samuel chapter 9 and into chapter 10, Verse 16. So if you want to look in your pew Bibles, it's page 427, Samuel chapter 9, 1 Samuel chapter 9. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Apia of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel and he was a head taller than anyone else. Now the donkeys belonged to Saul's father Kish were lost, and Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area around Selshusha, but they did not find them. 
They went on into the district of Shalem, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find them. When they reached the district of Zip, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let's go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, Look, in this town there is a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything he says comes true. Let's go then now. Perhaps he will tell us which way to take. Saul said to his servant, If we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered him again. Look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. Formerly in Israel, if someone went to inquire of God, they would say, come, let us go to the seer, because the prophet of today used to be called a seer. Good, Saul said to his servant, come, let's go. So they set out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some young women coming out to draw water, and they asked them, Is the seer here? He is, they answered. He's ahead of you. Hurry now. He has just come to our town today, for the people have a sacrifice at the high place. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice afterward. Those who are invited will eat. Go up now. You should find him about this time. They went up to the town. As they were entering it, there was Samuel coming toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will send you on your way and will tell you all that there is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them. They have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? Saul answered, But I am not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel, and is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? Then Samuel brought Saul and his servant into the hall and seated them at the head of those who were invited about 30 in number. Samuel said to the cook, bring the piece of meat I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took up the thigh which was on it and set it from front of Saul. Samuel said, here is what has been kept for you. Eat, because it was set aside for you to this occasion from the time I said, I have invited guests. And Saul dined with Samuel that day. After they came down from the high place to the town, Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They rose about daybreak, and Saul, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Get ready, and I will send you on your way. When Saul got ready, he and Samuel went outside together. As they were going down to the edge of this town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us, and the servant did so. But you stay here for a while, so that I may give you a message from God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, olive oil, and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelza on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, The donkeys you set out to look for have been found, and now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He is asking, what shall I do about my son? Then you will go on from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to worship God at Bethel will meet you there. 
One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will go to Gilbia of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, timbrels, pipes, and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me in Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gilbia, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man who lived there answered, And who is their father? So it became a saying, Is Saul among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, Where have you been? Looking for the donkeys, he said, but when he saw that there were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, tell me what Samuel said to you. Saul replied, he assured us that the donkeys had been found, but he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. So that's a long story, and there are all kinds of things that we could consider regarding that. But it seems to me that in order to sort of simplify things so that we can go home with something a little bit concrete anyways, God is doing something new in Israel. That is obvious. In fact, it is so new that there are three signs that are given to Saul to verify what is happening. He is anointed to be the next ruler or the first king of Israel. And there are three signs that he is given to ensure, to sort of verify that this is actually happening. And it says in the text that all three of them happen, but the text only highlights the third one, su- suggesting to us that it is the most significant and the one worthy of our attention. To be anointed means that one is set aside. One is given a particular purpose throughout the Old Testament into the New. That's what it means. The priests and the prophets are often anointed with oil. You can find all kinds of stories of that in the Old Testament. But mostly, anointing is about the kings. That the kings are anointed to lead God's people. They are called the Lord's anointed. And this business of anointing and the sign of the Spirit that I'll talk about in a moment become linked. And you can trace them throughout the scriptures. And one of the places where they come up they become most important is in Isaiah where the spirit of the Lord is upon me says the anointed of God and that text in Isaiah 61 is picked up by Jesus the spirit of the Lord sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor This is the text in Luke chapter 4, after which the people try to kill Jesus by throwing him off the cliff. Jesus claims the title of the anointed one. 
as the final king of Israel. For those of you who are into these things, the colors white and gold are behind me. Those are the colors of Epiphany. Today in the calendar of the church is Epiphany, Christ the King. It is the story of the, usually the story of the wise men that come to visit Jesus after his birth. But we're going to take up King's, or King Saul's story instead. But it's about kingship and about Christ being the final and greatest king that God sends to his people. The Heidelberg Catechism helps us understand what it means that Christ is the anointed. This is what it says. He was anointed. What, it mean, what does it mean that he's anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. What was Saul's task? It was to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. As much as Moses' task was to save Israel from the hand of the Egyptians, Saul's task was to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And so Christ came to deliver us, not from the hands of Egypt or the Philistines, but from the hands of Satan, to bring forgiveness of sins, to bring redemption. That's why Christ is anointed. He is also our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body. And who continually pleads our cause with the Father. And thirdly, says the Catechism, and our, he is our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. Do you hear what the Catechism says? Paul said in Ephesians 4 that I read for you earlier, I urge you, to live up to the calling which you have been given. Be completely humble, patient, kind, loving. Catechism understands that is central to the Christian life. The, the freedom to live as the people of God. No longer governed by sinfulness and sinful habits and desires. And Christ keeps us in that freedom. He has won it for us by defeating the powers of evil. Christ is the ultimate and final and only king that we need. But the catechism then goes on and says, but why are you called Christian? And it offers this powerful sentence, because by faith I am a member of Christ and so share in his anointing. When we come to Christ by faith, we are joined with him. Part of the, the teaching of both the sacrament of Lord's Supper and the sacrament of baptism is that we are joined and united with Christ. We are joined and united with his anointing. Set, called out from God, separated from the world to be his people, to be given his spirit. And I want to take a few moments, just a few, to ponder what it means that we are, we share in Christ's anointing. It is a, it is a seed that is planted here in the Old Testament in the story of Saul. It says in the text, that God changed Saul's heart. That the Spirit of God came upon Saul. Those three things, the anointing, the coming of the Spirit, and the changing of the heart, are little seeds that are joined together in this text. And you will find them woven throughout the Scriptures. And when you go back to Ephesians 4, sometime today, in the latter part of that chapter, 
you will discover that those things are there. That we are to live by the Spirit and we are to have a changed character. What does this mean? Well, the Bible says that Saul became a new person. His character was changed. This is the first time that this is mentioned in the Bible. That God comes upon someone and changes their heart, their character. Now we are joined with Christ. Christ came and, well, he didn't need a new character because he was God himself. He said in the book of John, he says, I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. John himself testified, we have seen the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth. When we look at Christ, we see God the Father. We see the person into whom we are being changed. We are called to be both followers and imitators of Christ. And the Spirit is given to us to that end and for that purpose. For Saul, it happened in a moment. The Pentecost story in Acts chapter 2 tells about the deep change that happened on that day. And sometimes it still happens that way. But often, it's a slower process. Paul says that we are to walk in step with the Spirit. Pay attention to that language. When you step, you're walking. We tend to want to run. We want to get it over with. And that, that's a good desire, mind you. But God generally works with us throughout our lifetime. As Eugene Peter said, the, lo the long road of, of obedience in the same direction. That's the story of the Christian life. That's the story of being changed into new character. We are anointed by God. We receive his spirit so that our characters are changed. So we can be useful in his kingdom. In order for Saul to become king, he needed to be changed. And we in the church still understand that today. That if we are to be useful for the kingdom, we need to be changed. I would say in the history of the church in North America in the last number of decades, our focus and our attention has been more on the gifts of the Spirit, the extraordinary things like speaking in tongues and prophesying and healing and prophetic ministries of being powerful preachers and such things. And yet throughout, the emphasis in the scriptures is more here on the character. And I think that if we've had our eyes open, we can see where that misdirection, misemphasis has led us in the past decade. It is high time that we focus again on character, both for those who lead the church and those who, for lack of a better expression, simply sit in the pew. Bad expression, I know. But it ought to be the goal of each of us to walk this road. One of the things that is clear in this passage is that this change of character happens by a submission to God's word. As I said before, Saul virtually doesn't act. The actor in this story is God himself. God is a driver of the story, bringing forward Saul as the, next, as the first king of Israel. Samuel is God's spokesperson. He speaks for, God's, for God. He speaks God's word. And the question for Saul is always and ever going to be, will he submit to Samuel as God's spokesperson? That's the tension, that's a challenge that gets played out through all Saul's kingship. Will he submit himself to God's word? In the book of Ezekiel, this whole business of a new heart comes back. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. 
I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. You see the echoes of Saul's story? And move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The anointing of the Spirit evokes in us, creates in us a submission to God's Word, a willingness to hear and to obey. The passage I read from Ephesians 4 ends with, do not grieve the Spirit of God. And Paul doesn't offer any kind of explanation in terms of what that means. But I think one of the things that we can understand it means we grieve the Spirit when we hear the Word of God and we turn a deaf ear to it. Or when the Word of God tells us to do one thing and we do another. If the Spirit of God is put in us to move us to follow His decrees, then surely to grieve the Spirit means that we turn a deaf ear to what the Spirit is saying. We thumb our noses at the movement of the Spirit. Paul says in Corinthians that we become a new creation in Christ. That's the work of the Spirit to make us new. The seeds for that are laid here in the story of Saul. And it gets worked out throughout the Scriptures. And so as you go home from here today, I invite you to consider Are you submitting yourself to the Spirit and the Word? Are you walking in step with the Spirit in the way of obedience? Are you allowing God to minister in your life, to change your character, your habits, your heart? Remember, remember the words of the Catechism, though, as you consider that. That Christ keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. This is where we often get it wrong. We beat, our, beat ourselves up because we are failures in this. And we tend to see the failure. And we give up. And we become depressed about our spiritual road. The teaching of the church and the scriptures is always this. That in the end, it's not up to us. But Christ has won the freedom for us from the powers of evil. He has hung them up. He has demonstrated that they are powerless. And so we enter into the Christian life, not from that perspective of, oh, woe is me, or from that perspective, can this be even be possible? but in the deep and abiding faith that Christ has made it so, that all the promises of God are yes in Christ. Yes, today we may fail and we may stumble. But God is going to pick us up. He is going to put us back on our feet. And he's going to say, I forgive you. And he's going to say, let's keep going. The promise of Pentecost is that the Spirit of God is never taken away from his people again. And he will stay with us until he has perfected us. And we are indeed new creations in Christ. And that hope and that faith go forth, trusting that the Spirit will walk with you. Amen. Lord God, may we hear this word. May we hear the word of assurance and be encouraged in our Christian walk. In your name we pray. Amen. Our musicians are going to come and lead us in song, Change My Heart, O God. I invite you to stand as the music begins. Yeah.
Thanks for listening in. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow as we continue our daily devotions and our wilderness wanderings. As you journey on into the week ahead, go with the blessing of God. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Thank you.